spin. Good morning, everyone. I'm in our desire to get the sound system working right. Can you tell me? Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. With that, I'm going to go and meet the rest of the guys at the back of church, and we will stand for our first prayer and our first hymn. Excuse me. Thank you. So let us pray. Holy, righteous, and merciful God, enable us by your grace to offer true worship and joyful service. Cleanse our minds and free our consciences from the things that hide you from us, and unite us one with another in the fellowship of the Spirit, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. We begin our service by, by singing our first hymn, hymn 93, Christ whose glory fills the skies.
Good morning and a very warm welcome to you all this morning. And that's to those of us who are here and those of us who are watching online and those who may watch later in the week. We are climbing quickly towards Lent, which is quite an amazing thing because it's all about preparation. So we're thinking of our preparation for Lent and what it actually means to us. So our theme today, if there is a theme for the service, is actually shining lights. Do we have a shining light or is our light dimmed? But before we do, the Sunday School are so eager to get to Sunday School, they've already gone, but let us say a quick prayer for them. Say, Lord God and Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are at Sunday School this morning, for the teachers and the youngsters, that they may be filled with your light anew, afresh, as they see and hear the words of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So let's together pray our prayer of welcome. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and that in the secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbors as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. So God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Therefore, let us sit or kneel to confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Amen. So we say together, most Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
we stand to sing the Gloria. We remain standing to pray the collect for today. Holy God, you know the disorder of our sinful lives. Set straight our crooked hearts and bend our wills to, your lo to love your goodness and your glory in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We now sit for our readings. The first reading today is from the second book of Kings, chapter 2, from the beginning. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, and as you live, you, you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. For the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what may I do for you before I'm taken from you? Elisha said, Please, let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. 
and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is Psalm 50, beginning from verse 1 till 6. The Lord, the most mighty God, has spoken and called the world from the rising of the sun to its setting. Consuming fire goes out before him, and a mighty tempest stirs about him. He calls the heaven above, and the earth, and he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful, who have sealed my covenant with sacrifice. morning, as Nick is reading the reading from 2 Corinthians, I wonder if you could actually follow it very closely on your pew sheets, because this morning that's what I'm going to preach on. Thank you, Nick. We will uh, read uh, from the New Testament, the second letter, Corinthians, chapter 4, verses uh, 3 to 6. And even if your gospel is wild, it is wild to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has belied the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from sign the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus sake for is it is that the God to, who said let light shine out this darkness who has shone in your heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ this is the word of the Lord. Then we stand now for our second hymn, 210. God of mercy, God of grace.
hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white and as no one on earth could bleach them. And then there appeared to him Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw that no one was with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen, until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Please be seated. So as I said when Nick was reading from Corinthians, this is what the, the sermon will be based on this morning. And it begins with, even if our gospel is veiled, it is only veiled to those who are perishing. So, those who are already on the road to ruin cannot see the wonders that our gospel has. Now, Paul uses the incident from Mark to teach the Corinthians the consequences of veiling or covering up the gospel message. Some of the difficult Cor Corinthians, for they were a difficult crowd, were actually covering up the message in a way that people who are lost do not get to see the light of the truth or to see the freedom from their sins or the wonderful new meaning that will free them from the chains of this wider world. In case those of you who are perishing, your God is the God of this world. With its bright lights and its shiny things, with its new gadgets and gizmos. That God, the worldly God, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. And he, he's, he, she, they have done so to keep the unbelievers from seeing the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gods of the secular world 
fool people into boasting their achievements, living beyond their means, and not worrying who or how many people they need to kick on their way to their flaky lifestyle. Paul is urging us not to proclaim ourselves, for the glory is God's. And that is why we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. The things we, as believers, achieve are not accomplished in our own strength, but in God's. Now that, those few words, those few lines, may sound rather confusing, so I'm going to try something different to explain what it might mean. So remember Paul, he was Saul, who not only persecuted Jesus, but he hounded anything and anyone who was Christian. However, on his way to Damascus, he had a vision that changed his life. And according to Galatians, 1.16, God revealed to Saul that he, Jesus was his son. So according to Galatians, Paul suddenly realizes because he has been revealed to him in person that Jesus is God's son. In fact, Paul states that in Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians, chapter 9, verse 1, he actually sees the Lord. And in the book of Acts, we hear that when Paul was on the Damascus road, he was blinded by this amazing light. When he saw the light, and understood what Jesus was about, he not only realized that his previous behavior was dark and deep. He saw and realized, maybe not all at once, but perhaps gradually, the errors of his ways and the need for change within himself. As I often do, I have some questions for you this morning. I want you to answer them silently, but truthfully, from deep within your heart and soul. Do you believe that there is evil in this world? Do you believe that there is good in this world? Do you believe that there are evil forces at work? Do you believe that some people live on the dark side of life, while some live in the light? Do you believe in good and bad? If you have answered yes to any of those questions, You've come to the right place this morning, for your journey has brought you to a place where this morning you will hear more about living in the light. Now, if you've answered no to any of those questions, you'll be surprised to hear that you also have come to the right place. So how can that be? Well, I'd like us to look at some opposites. Honest, dishonest, hot, cold, desperate, hopeful, unclothed, Clothed, uncovered, covered. 
That is what the reading of Corinthians is about this morning. Paul is talking about opposing and unequal forces that are at work in this world. Paul is drawing a steep contrast between God, with a small g, of this world, who trades in spreading the darkness, to the attitude of I, myself, and me, first and foremost, the god of selfishness, the lure of spending what you haven't got, the easy money from credit cards. That is the god of unbelievers. But of course, to believe just doesn't happen. Not for everybody, anyway. I think not for most people. You have to work at it. You need to study the Gospels. You need to seek for yourself and find people trustworthy in faith to help you on your journey. Those who have received and felt this divine experience are called not only to invite others, but constantly evaluate their own conduct before God, lest they slip, lest we slip into the abyss of self-promotion. That means that both you and I are called to, called to proclaim the light of Jesus in the darkness of this broken world. The light that Jesus brings with his message not only brings a better light to how we see our lives and how we live them, but there is also a lightness in our steps and a lightness in our demeanor when we have received that peace which passes all understanding. God shines in our hearts. Moreover, if the light of the gospel enables us to see and shine with the glory of God, the very image of God, then the reverse is true. So when the light shines within us, the God of the secular world is actually diminished. Things, of course, even though we believe, may be difficult at times. But Paul says that since we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. So even though we may face tough times, it is the hope we have in Jesus and the love of God that holds us steadfast. In the reading and other readings that we will hear, Paul has renounced hidden things of dishonesty and does not walk in craftiness or handle the word of God deceitfully. He wants to show us how we should live. He preaches the truth plainly, although sometimes what Paul preaches gives us an uncomfortable feeling. He is not afraid to talk honestly or plainly, and he doesn't shy away from difficult situations. Paul tells us that God can bring light to every dark corner of the world and of our lives. And this is what ties us to the transfiguration. Jesus is the transfiguration. His clothes became so dazzling white that even bleach could not whiten them any further. And Jesus can do the same for us too. When we have a relationship with Jesus, we too are transfigured from the old person that we were into something new, something 
that we could never ever comprehend. Our old way is put away. The new way, God's way, takes us from darkness to light. So let us pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, help us move from our selfish and ignorant ways that keep us in a life of darkness and possible shame. Show us into a new way of life where the light of your Son shines in and through us. Amen. So now let us stand to affirm our faith by sharing the creed. So let us now sit or deal for our prayers of intercession, and Pat will lead us. This is working. I believe it is. <clears throat> With gratitude for the gift of Christ, let us draw near to our Heavenly Father in prayer, asking His mercy for the Church, the world, and for all who need His loving kindness. Let us pray. We give thanks for your church throughout the world, that it is a place of shelter, security, and sanctuary. We pray for our community at St. Andrews in Moscow. We pray for wisdom, for courage, for clarity of thought, for a quiet place where we can make wise decisions. And we pray for the resources and support to act on those wise decisions. We pray with gratitude for the safe return of Reverend Sharon and her care for our community. We pray for Archdeacon Leslie as he searches to find a new permanent chaplain for St. Andrews. We pray for our lay church leaders, for our music makers, coffee makers, cake bakers, 
the hospitality team, our guards, cleaners, administrators, and legal team, for all who with grateful hearts are ready to do all of the jobs that need doing. We pray for success as we apply for various permissions to begin restoration of our exterior brickwork in April. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the wider church, we pray for Archbishops Justin of Canterbury, Stephen of York, Bishop Robert of the Anglican Diocese in Europe. We pray for Bishop David, also of the, of the Diocese in Europe, who recently entered retirement. We pray for our sister churches, particularly those in Eastern Europe. We pray for Patriarch Kirill, for Metropolitan Anthony, for Pope Francis, for Protestant church leaders. We pray for all children of Abraham, for Jews and Muslims, all who assist refugees and who work to restore conflicts, resolve conflicts throughout the world. We pray for Christians persecuted throughout the world, those in physical danger, and those silenced by political correctness. We pray for the work of the Barnabas Fund. Above all, we pray for peace. Peace in Gaza, peace in Ukraine, peace in Sudan. Free us from the terror of war wherever it may rage, as well as the violence and drug-driven crime in city streets in the United States and Europe, as well as other troubled urban areas of the world. We pray for peace in our hearts. Help us to love one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that secular authorities may rule with wisdom. We pray for Vladimir Putin, for Volodymyr Zelensky, for their foreign ministers and key policy makers, and for foreign leaders whose influence affects their decision making. We pray for Joe Biden, Rishi Sunak, Emmanuel Macron, Olaf Scholz, and other leaders of the EU. We pray for Xi Jinping, we pray for leaders in Iran. We pray for King Charles for his health, and we pray for the royal family, expressing gratitude for our Christian heritage as Anglicans in a worldwide communion of believers, a church rooted in the compassion of Jesus Christ. We pray for those voting in Wednesday's general election in Indonesia that they may choose wise and just leaders. Lord, in your mercy. <clears throat> we thank you, Lord, for all the abundance of the world, an abundance that gifts us with food and the essentials of life. Provide, Lord, for those who lack such essentials because of war, famine, human greed, and mismanagement of resources. We pray especially for those fleeing violence in Ukraine and for those organizations and individuals offering relief both east and west. Shelter, medical care, emotional support, food and clothing, a simple sense of safety. We pray especially for the work of the Russian Orthodox Refugee Center here in Moscow. We pray for refugees wherever they may be found. We pray for the weak, the rejected, those injured mentally or physically by violence or the fear of violence. We pray for those in hospital and for the sick who lack the resources to obtain medical care. We pray especially for David Ward for Penelope, 
for Olga and Alexandra, for Anna's friend Igor, her mother Elena, and her friend Sultan, who is grieving the death of his stepfather. We pray also for Blake and for Tom. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. we remember those who have died and for those who mourn their loss. As we journey into Lent, we rejoice in the mysteries of salvation. We rejoice that you raised your son, Jesus Christ, triumphant over death, sin, and evil. In his death, you have destroyed death, and in his rising to life, you have opened to us the kingdom of heaven, renewing in us faith in our own resurrection. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your... We stand for the peace. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God and we meet in his name and we share in his peace. The peace of the Lord always be with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. sing our next hymn which is our offertory hymn and during that hymn there will be a collection if you would prefer to use your card there are card terminals out in the narthex so we begin to sing our offertory hymn which is number 669 we hail 699, sorry, 699, we hail thy presence glorious.
your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord God, our light and our salvation. To you be glory and praise forever. From the beginning you have created all things, and all your works echo the praise uh, of your silent music of your praise. In the fullness of time you made us in your image, the crown of all creation. You give us breath and speech, that with angels and archangels and all the powers of heaven, we may find a voice to sing your praise. Wonderful the work of your hands, O Lord. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embrace the people as your own. When they turned away and rebelled, your love remained steadfast. From them you raised up Jesus, our Savior, born of Mary to be the living bread, in whom all our hungers are satisfied. He offered his life for sinners, and with a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms on the cross. And on the night before he died, he came to supper with his friends. Taking bread, he gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. So, Father, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. We remember his dying and rising in glory, and we rejoice that he intercedes for us at your right hand. Pour out your Holy Spirit as we bring before you these gifts of your creation. May they be for us the body and the blood of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. And as we eat these drinks, eat and drink these holy gifts in your presence, form us in the likeness of Christ and build us into a living temple to your glory. Bring us at the last with St. Mark and St. Andrew and all the saints to the vision of that eternal splendor for which you have created us through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing, Amen. So as our Saviour taught us, let us sit and kneel to pray. Our 
We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are So draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. So the Lord's table is prepared and everybody is welcome to either share in communion or to have a blessing or both if you wish. There will be two stations for the host and Eskadar will be on one side and I will be on the other. And there will be Anna and Hobby who will be distributing the blood. So please come as you... Feel the spirit moves you.
pray together our post-communion collect, followed by the prayer together. So, Holy God, you see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. We see the glory in the face of Jesus Christ. So may we who are partakers at his table reflect his life in word and deed, that all the world may know his power to change and save. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we say together, Almighty So now I'm going to invite Pat up for the notices. Birthdays. I believe there were birthdays? Polina. Yeah, Polina, there was birthdays. Are you coming or are your sons going to collect the chocolate? Mm. And Nicola? Oh, he is going to pick the chocolate. What do you want, Leo? Oh, it's too much juice. Uh huh. Do we sing happy birthday or not? Birthday, yeah. Okay, happy birthday to Happy birthday to you Happy birthday to you Okay, number two Wednesday is, believe it or not, Ash Wednesday. It may be 20 below, but Lent is starting and we're marching towards Easter. Uh, the service will be at 7 p.m. It will, as usual, be a Eucharist with imposition of ashes. And Ephraim just informed me that he's going to be here Wednesday and will live stream it. So those of you who follow us on live stream, we will be live streaming Ash Wednesday uh, service um, as it happens. Um, with the start of Lent also comes Maslenitsa, pancakes. And we'll be having our own pancakes, blini, whatever. I mean, there are many, many different types, and we probably will have several different types uh, available with coffee after, uh, after the service. This pancake feast will also be kicking off our Lenten charity appeal, okay? And throughout Lent, every Sunday, we will be offering a light lunch of soup, bread, and cheese after the service. Many of you who have been part of St. Andrew's for uh, some time uh, are aware that we always do this during Lent. And donations that are received, it is a free lunch. There really is such a thing as a free lunch. But we do encourage donations, which we then pass out to whatever charity or charities we are supporting uh, during, uh, uh, during, during Lent. Now, the free will donations that we're asking at this time, we are again going to be supporting the Russian Orthodox Refugee Center, which focuses on people who are fleeing Ukraine from the east and oftentimes show up in Moscow with nothing but the clothes on, the back, on their backs. Their greatest need at present is space heaters. And if you want to talk more about the center and the management of the center, I encourage you to speak to Camilla during the coffee because she is actively involved with them. It's fair to say that? 
Yeah, it's fair to say that. And at some time during Lent, we are going to be offering anyone who wants to go over after service and see what they do. Their, their center is uh, near Taganka Metro. Uh, we'll be offering that for anyone who would like to actually have a look-see at the facility and, and what we're supporting. We are ordering Monday 15 space heaters off of Wildberries, which is going to cost 42,000 rubles. That's the target of what we need to reach over the next six weeks in terms of donations, uh, because the deal was we get that money in advance, and then we basically raise the funds over the six weeks to pay it back. And considering the weather these days, I think they need space heaters now rather than at the first of, of April. We already have pledges for 10,000 rubles. So as word is passing through the congregation, people are already coming forward. So what we'll have to recover is really only 32,000. And I want you to think of it this way. If you have 3,000 in your pocket, 3,000 buys one space heater, okay? If you and your friend want to each contribute 1,500, you and your friend have just bought a space heater. If you have four friends, 750 rubles apiece, you've bought a space heater. So if you look at it in those terms, or if you look at it as, I've got 50 rubles and that's it, it all adds up. And at the end of the six weeks, we will indeed be able to reach that target, if not before. There will be a collection box on the table today. Is that correct, Liz? Okay. And uh, at the end of Lent, uh, any overflow that we will have uh, would be given to the Barnabas Fund, which is a UK-based international charity, most of you know it, uh, that helps persecuted Christians worldwide. And so we actually have two, two targets this year, Orthodox Refugee Center and Barnabas, I'm just plugging the Refugee Center right now because we have to come up with the 42,000 rubles in order to pay for what we're ordering on faith, the 15, uh, the 15 uh, Abagler Vatali uh, that we're ordering. Uh, also beyond that, next Sunday, we will again be collecting clothing, blankets, and non-perishable food, food items, which will be likewise distributed uh, as we did uh, with the Lent appeal. And probably when we bring those over every couple of weeks, that will be a time when if you want to visit the center, you're more than welcome to do so. I'd like to close with something for whatever reason, and I don't know why. This morning, the parable of the Good Samaritan was on my mind. Because usually when I read that, I focus on that guy walked past that injured man and he didn't do anything. Oh, he's a hypocrite, you know, that sort of thing. And I'm sure many of you probably do the same thing. You know, it, it's just natural. But what jumped out at me when I was reading it again and getting the same, he's a bad guy, he's a bad guy, he's a good guy, sort of thing. And these are all, by the way, guys that are representing different political or religious disputes that were going on at that time. 2,000 years ago. Of course, we don't have any of those disputes today, she said. The universal point, though, of that parable, in my opinion, is very simple, and it's the final exchange between Jesus and the expert on the law. And that's when Jesus asks the legal expert, the lawyer, the lawyer, who in the story was the neighbor of the injured man. The focus needs to be on the injured man. That whore did or did not do something. And the doctor of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Hope to see many of you Wednesday night. And Sharon, would you like to say anything? I, I would. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, I, I like the idea, actually, that uh, you know, if we share our giving, how much we can actually, how many space heaters 
and Barnabas funds that we can actually raise. Lent is all about our penitence. It's all about the times that we've seen that we've erred and strayed and we're coming back to Christ for Easter Day. But also, I think, it's a case that we have many, we have much, don't we? And I think giving to the, the refugee centre um, is definitely giving to our neighbour in need. And I, I think that's a wonderful thing to say. So please enjoy what's on offer the next few weeks, but remember in your hearts what it's for, okay, and what we're giving for. I have one more announcement. If you are dressed like a penguin today, or if, no, sorry, it's not a penguin, it's panda bears. Panda bears. So if you could nip home, get yourself into a panda bear costume, you can actually get into the zoo free. Okay, but you have to dress as penguin. Uh, I'm a fascinated with penguins, I think it's because it's still cold. Panda bears, can I ask these two panda bears to stand up? <laughs> so, thank you for representing us today and sharing with us the good news that if you're dressed as a panda, you get into the zoo free. So, let us stand, let us stand for God's blessings and our final hymn. Say so the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of God and the love of his Son, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God, Father and Son, be with you today and every day. Amen. And we sing our final hymn, which is 458, Name of All Majesty. <laughs> 